So good evening. Hello. Everybody all right? Yes. You've got to be very quiet at the moment. Talk back to me later. It's very interesting when you get introduced to run a workshop on the imposter syndrome as a real expert in this. Because the reason I know a fair bit about it is how I feel comfortable in saying it now is because I also have very definitely felt it and still sometimes feel like a fraud. It's the, who am I to speak to Oxford University Women in Business group? And then the other part of me goes, well, who am I not to? And this is sometimes for you, this questioning might go on inside your head. Well, who am I to? And then the other side might go, well, who are you not to? And what we're going to do this evening is explore a little bit about the imposter phenomenon as it should be called. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction into what the phenomenon is, what it isn't, tell you a little bit more about myself and how I've come to be here and ask you about what you would like to get from this afternoon's evening's session. So you've got a, a slide up there that says a little bit about the imposter phenomenon itself. If you feel it, it's not saying you are a real imposter. So from that point of view, we talk about it being a phenomenon. It's not a syndrome, although everybody is terming it a syndrome. So the syndrome aspect is what the Oxford English Dictionary put into the dictionary in April 2017 and invited me to write the accompanying blog post. And I went, ah, oh, really? Sure you've got that right? Mm -hmm. Anyway. So I did. So the, the imposter syndrome phenomenon, it's a phenomenon because it occurs at certain points in time. Not everybody feels it all of the time and some people feel it a lot and some people never get it. So we'll explore about that side of things. So it's an intellectual feeling of phoniness. It was de designed, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was defined as this feeling of intellectual phoniness by Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes back in 1978. They noticed as two both lecturers and therapists in their university in the States that a number of their colleagues and students were experiencing this. They thought at the time it was mainly a female phenomenon. Now, if you look around the room, you might think, well, maybe that is true. <laughs> One of the other things that crops up is that sometimes it's not just women that experience it, but women and men experience it differently. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Why is it a problem or what can, why can it cause problematic situations? Well, it can create high levels of stress and anxiety. It can mean that some people are experiencing a, mm, I mustn't put myself forward for this. I mustn't put myself forward to speak up in a tutorial. I mustn't put myself forward for that particular internship because, well, I might not get it. And in particular in the workplace, I mustn't put myself forward for promotions. But then other people do and other people speak up and you're thinking, well, that was what I was thinking or I was thinking what the tutors just said a moment ago in answer to that question. So you then realise actually inside your head, you can think to yourself, well, I know that I should have spoken up. And you can then be, sometimes there's a little bit of a spiral of anxiety, like, damn, I really should have done that. I really should have said something. So it's that type of thinking that's the problem. It's an internal thinking. It's not actually anything that means you are a fraud. So let's explore it in a, in a little bit more detail. I'll tell you a bit about me. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. This is a quote attributed to Henry Ford. And just for a moment, I'd like to invite you all to stand up. Reread the quote and stay standing if you think Henry Ford is right. Sit down if you think he's wrong. Okay, we've got one person, two people sat down, the rest of you staying standing. Now, those of you who are standing are very much like I was over a number of years, and you can see with the grey hairs that I am way beyond your university <laughs> age. And, and this point of thinking that you can, it's a mindset thing. There's lots and lots you'll find out there about affirmations that say you've really got to get the mindset to believe that you can do something. I worked really hard on my mindset for so many years 
And it was in 2014 that I found out and thought, do you know what? I think Henry Ford's wrong. <laughs> I'll explain why. So if you could sit yourselves down. A little bit about me first. The middle one of three girls growing up. Born in Lincolnshire, farmer's daughter, brought up in a very rural environment. And my comfort zone was in amongst the chickens and the geese. <laughs> very happy having the geese so close by. Anybody else in the room really happy that close to a goose? Yes. <laughs> few of you, not many, but yeah, a few of you. Excellent. Uh, anybody really does not want to be that close to a goose? Yeah, okay. What's interesting is when it's your comfort zone, you don't realise that other people are uncomfortable because it's something that's very normal and natural to you. So that was me, that was where I was very happy. My older sister was 16 months older than me and she passed the 11 plus. So the sorting exam that particularly in Lincolnshire at the time existed and continued to exist for a long while and in some places still does, that says whether you're academic and whether you're clever, you will go to the grammar school. I failed. My younger sister passed. I was at the secondary modern school, not the grammar. My head then goes, I'm not academic, I'm not clever, I can't do this stuff. I can remember one of my, it was my English teacher, coming to the farm one point, we had a pick your own, we did pick your own strawberries, and he came down there, and I done was doing A-levels at the time, and he said, you ought to go to university. I'm not university material, my head went. There is no way I can go to university. It's just not in my mindset of being able to think that I could do that. If I wind the clock forward a number of years, it's 10 years ago, just coming up this April, since I married my husband. And there's a bit of a long story, which will be a very short one. He went for a charity walk, took a year out of work after we met and walked around England to raise awareness of mental health issues. When he came back, I thought, it's my turn. I'd like to do something. So I was very supportive of him in doing his, his year-long walk. And I said, you know what? I'd really like to learn something. You're good at looking on the internet. Do a search for me and find something that I can learn. He came back and said, I think you should do a master's in applied positive psychology. <laughs> I'm not academic. I'm not clever. I'm not university material. There's no way a university will want me. I do not have a first degree. I cannot do this. <laughs> in 2015, I graduated with distinction from the University of East London with a Master's in Applied Positive Psychology. I am now a year and a half into a PhD studying the imposter phenomenon. And my head still sometimes goes, I'm not academic, I'm not clever, I'm not university material, there's no way I can do this. And yet the external evidence is saying different. And it was at that point that I'm thinking Henry Ford is wrong because there are some people in this world who think they can, but they can't. You may have come across some. I'm sure you will come across some when you get into the world of work. And there are definitely people in this world who think they can't, but they can. And being in this room, this might apply to you. Equally, it might not, but it might apply to some friends that you have. You might know some people that experience this. So the course of this evening, we're going to unpick this bit about the exploring of whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. Because quite often, if you think you can't, you're wrong, not right. Because what you haven't done is you haven't internalised the external evidence to say, yes, I can do this, I am academic, I am clever, I am deserving of the university place. I am here at Oxford and be proud of it. Does that make sense to you? So, having given you just a little bit of a flavour, could you talk to your neighbour and find out why they're here, what you would like to get from this evening's session? So have a brief conversation with each other, see what would you like to get out of this evening's session? By seven o'clock, what questions do you want to have answered? Quick conversation. <laughs> That I always find is better than me shouting. So if you hear the sound, it's a way of just bringing you, bringing you back. You could talk for quite a long while, I'm sure, about what's brought you here and what you want to get out of this evening. But that doesn't mean you get anything out of this evening other than chatting to each other. So I thought if we do this, and I'll flip up some of your ideas of questions that you want, and then we'll, we'll look to answering them. 
So, anybody want to pitch up one of the things that you were discussing? Anything about what you want to get out of this evening? So, yeah, thank you for the questions. Lovely. So, we'll pick up on these ones and do some answering of these questions during the course of the session. How many people experience it? What do you reckon? How common is this, this phenomenon? Anybody want to make a guess? Probably like 95%. 95? It's lower than 95. It's about 70, according to one piece of <laughs> academic research. And this is the thing, when you know, when you're doing the, the research, you think, well, that's only one paper. Where's it being correlated and justified and all the rest of it? Well, there's, this paper keeps getting cited. 70% of people will experience it at some point in their lives. When I look at things, um, there's other research that comes out that says sort of three quarters of millennials will experience the imposter phenomenon in the workplace. Okay, that's similar to the 70% then, so we're not far off. But if you experience it, the key thing is you're not alone. With one of these things, it's one of these phenomena people don't like to talk about. Because if you want to fess up and say, do you know what, I feel a bit like a fraud, who really wants to tell people that? So when I do it, the workshops in organisations, sometimes we put it about success, what lies behind the mask, because we don't like to talk about the imposter syndrome. It's one of those things where they're going, mm, I don't know that I want to fess up to being an imposter. So 70% of people, generally speaking, at some point will experience it. What it's not and what it differs from is something that's called the Dunning-Kruger. So somebody who has the imposter feelings typically will have a very high actual ability. But inside your head, you think it's not. You think that somehow you've got there by luck, by fluke, by chance or by hard work. And I'll come back to those. But then there's the flip opposite, which is the Dunning-Kruger, which I think is so aptly named after two of the people that named it. The Dunning-Kruger is where they believe they have this really high actual ability, but the reality is that they don't. So I think neither are helpful or healthy. What we ought to aim for is to get to somewhere in the middle where your perceived ability is alongside your actual ability. So coming to this point about how not to feel it when you're doing something new, well, you haven't got an actual ability if it's brand new circumstances. So it's not the imposter you're feeling, it's normal self-doubt but you have got the past of some actual ability that's in a slightly different field or a similar field that you can then reflect on and bring with you. And I'll come back to that. Does that make sense? So you're thinking about the way in which you cope with it. So people also say, well, surely if I hang on to my imposter feelings, they're good because they give me a push, they make me strive, they make me want to do things. Comes with a heightened cost of anxiety. It comes with that heightened stress levels. And that's where I think it would be really useful if we could just look at overcoming it and dampening down that inner chatter. So these are some of the comments that people will make with, there's an academic and very well validated questionnaire if you're doing research in it, which is one I'm using for my research, is done by Pauline Clance called the Clance Imposter Phenomenon Scale. And these are some of the things that are on there that talk about, I have this dread of being evaluated. I fear that others are going to find out how much knowledge I lack. So for instance, speaking up in tutorials when you're in a small group and you're going, mm, and then are they going to judge me? for the question that I've asked or the statement that I've made if it's not right? Is it going to expose me as not being valid and being here? It's the internal chatter. If you don't ask, you will never know the answers. We've got to be willing to partake and willing to take some risks. It's the aspect of learning something doesn't come from staying safe. You have to take some risks to learn. So you have to do a little bit of stretching along the way. So where does it come from? Coming back to the point at the back, for you two chaps, it does often come from being in the minority. It does often come from the fact that you look around and think, should I really be here? Am I, um, is my presence valid? It can come from upbringing, so parenting. My father, love him to bits. He's hypercritical. Nothing's ever quite right. When I did my master's, I was then invited to do an interview for Cambridge TV because I researched the imposter phenomenon within entrepreneurs. So it's on an entrepreneurial section of, the, of Cambridge TV. I sent him the link to the video and he said, oh, thank you very much. I now understand more about it. 
However, <laughs> there were a couple of times when you sped up and your voice tailed off towards the ends of your sentences and I couldn't quite catch what you were saying. Brackets. Dads are allowed to be hypercritical. <laughs> They're supposed to be hyper supportive in my mind. But when you've got someone who always thinks that you could do that much bit better, that bit better, it's supportive, it's encouraging, it's the intention is to enable you to improve. The reality might mean that you feel that nothing is ever good enough. So it's sometimes it's that hypercritical parenting. Sometimes it's the opposite. It's hyper supportive parenting where they say, you can do anything. You will be amazing. Wh whatever you do, it will be fantastic. And then you fail at some point because it will happen if it hasn't happened yet. And you're going, oh my goodness, I can't do everything now. You apply for an internship, get knocked back. You apply for a job, get knocked back. You put an essay in and the mark isn't what you'd hoped. Those things will happen if you're stretching and trying and doing something different. But it doesn't mean that you're an imposter, but it can trigger the imposter feelings. It can trigger this, oh my goodness, I'm not good enough. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be doing. So those are some of the places that it comes from. They've been, they've been well researched in academia. How do you get over the feelings? How do you cope and manage with these imposter feelings? Well, one piece of research again has come up with a surprising result when they were looking at the, the people they were interviewing and asking them a number of questions about their experience of the imposter phenomenon. And one of the things that they found that was a thread through the participants were the comments at the end. Thank you. I now feel much better about myself. Now I know more about it. I know it's a thing, it's not me. And it's really been helpful to talk about it. So one of the things we encourage you to do is to talk about the mask. So could I give you an opportunity now to go back to the small groups, couple of people that you were chatting to and just say, have you felt it? If so, where? And where might it differ from that normal self-doubt of not knowing whether you've got the success, it's where you have already been successful. So have a quick conversation amongst each other. Where might you have experienced this? <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. So what was it like having a conversation about imposter feelings? and your experience or not of it. What was it like chatting to someone else in the room? Yeah, and it, sometimes it's, what, you too? Particularly if it's someone that you know that you're speaking to in the workplace sometimes, or you know, other people that are in your, your hall, some, or in your college that you've known quite a bit, and then you sort of chat to them after, to, after tonight, and they'll go, yeah, I feel like that. And you think, wow, I always thought you had this super confident, super wonderful outlook and, and were fantastic. And they're fessing up on something that's on the inside. So it's not actually visible. This is one of those things that people do find that we keep a good facade on the outside. It's a bit like I said, there's a mask here that says everything's in control. And you're going, it's not really on the inside. But other times then when you have spoken about it, it's much easier to have the conversations and people understand what's real, what's really going on, rather than having superficial conversations. So yeah, going quite deep is quite, it's quite nice sometimes, get to know people that way. No, because I haven't got to that bit yet specifically, but you're <laughs> absolutely right. So if we're looking at self-doubt, self-doubt is normal. There's a slide that I've got later on that actually says that. You know, the self-doubt that, have I done this and can I do this? It's it, the can I do this is normal self-doubt if you're doing it for the first time. It's normal self-doubt, probably if you're doing it for the second or third time and you haven't got a track record of success. The imposter phenomenon is this self-doubt that says, I'm waiting to be found out. I'm waiting for the admissions team to come back and tell me that I shouldn't have got my place at Oxford. That's the self-doubt that that's the, it fuels the imposter, is when you've got the success, they've said, yes, we want you here, and you're thinking they must have made a mistake. That's the imposter self-doubt. 
I'm doing this for the first time. It's the first time I've written an essay and submitted it last term. If you were in the first year, normal. Normal self-doubt. Can I do this? What's it going to be like? What's the marking structure like? I'm going to find my, find my way along things. Meeting people for the first time, going into the, into the union bar, you know, that shall I go in or shall I not? Those sorts of self-doubt, that's normal self-doubt. Will anyone want to talk to me? Will I find anything in common with people? Those things are normal. But then going in and thinking, oh my goodness, will anyone want to talk to me? When you've been there several times, that's a different matter. Yeah. So it's the, it's the differentiation, more about the experience and success that you've had. And in many ways, the more successful you are, the more the imposter is likely to be felt. So getting into Oxford is one of those massive success things. So it's unsurprising that you feel it, if that makes sense. Right. Well, Coming back to this point about when you're going to do it, feel it when doing something new, the chances are you will still have that normal self-doubt. There's a quote by Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, which I came across a number of years ago, which I think puts the comfort zone thing into, into perspective, is that you can be green and growing or ripe and rotten. The choice is yours. But which would you rather be? You know, throughout life, you're going to rather be green and growing or ripe and rotten. And if you're going to continue to make use of the Oxford education, to continue to stretch, to apply for jobs, to get onto a graduate scheme, to go and, and be, have a successful career, those things mean that you will be constantly stretching. You'll be constantly feeling some green and growing inside, which is a level of nervousness. But it doesn't mean that you are an imposter. You do not have to equate the two. Does that help? Yeah. yeah? Any other questions that crop up, feel free to to ask them as we go. So talking about the mask, encouraging other people to talk about the mask. When you talk about it, you may hear people say things or you may have said things like this. So there's things along the lines of, I just got lucky, yeah? They were being nice to me. Nobody just gives you a place at Oxford because they thought you were a nice person, okay? Sorry about that. Um, they might have liked you, but it actually isn't part of the assessment criteria. Yeah, it's thinking about, do you, you can't put it down to that level of kindness or that they've made a mistake. You've got here because you went through the assessment, you went through the interviews, you met the grades from a requirement and you deserve the place to be here. Then when you get new submit your essay, so my first ever academic essay also got a distinction. I thought they must have made a mistake. But then I thought, well, actually, I did work really, really, really hard on my first ever ac academic essay, so hard that my husband almost threatened to divorce me. He said, you think more about that master's than you do of me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Stuart. Um, but it's that point where I got so focused and so intense. So I did, I worked really, really hard on it. But that also fueled the anxiety. So it's not because I worked hard, there was hard work involved, but there must somewhere along the line be some ability to read the information, assimilate it, and then put out something that's comprehensible to other people. Yes, hard work is involved, but it's not the be all and end all. That's not why you were successful. So you can't just put it down to hard work. You can't put it down to just doing what people expect. And you really shouldn't put it down to, well, if I can, anyone can. Because it's the, if I can, I have. Not anyone, but I have. Others could and others are, absolutely, but not anyone. Own it as your success. One of the differences that comes up between men and women about the imposter phenomenon is that women tend to externalize the successes and internalize the failures. And we tend to say, oh my goodness, that failure is down to something that's inherently I've done that wasn't right. Men will tend to put failures down to some external circumstance. And it tends to be the opposite for successes. Men will go, yep, own it, got it, sorted. And women tend to put the successes down to the external circumstances, not their own abilities. Now that's a generalization. It's not true of every individual. 
but we also need to, I think everybody needs to start to own their own knowledge, skills and abilities that have helped create the successes. So you've all got knowledge, skills and abilities that you have put into the essays, into the outcomes that you have then been getting, into the feedback that you've been receiving. And you shouldn't dismiss that, you should own it. So we also need to take a note of the feedback. Now was it, how many, was it, it wasn't even a minute each day, who was doing the filming of them, of them? yes yeah, sorry, was it, how long was it? A one second of each day. We were just talking beforehand about this idea of filming a very short clip of something that then says, this is my collection of what I've done during the course of my term at Oxford or my year at Oxford or whatever it might happen to be, or my life if you want to carry it on. But this idea of collecting something as a record. May I suggest that you extend it to collecting the positive feedback? So it's not just collecting the feedback on your marks, but collecting positive feedback that you might get through tutorial comments, through other things that you happen to have discussions with people, your colleagues, your peers. Collect that positive feedback somewhere. Because what happens when you have, a, I call it a wobble now rather than the imposter feeling specifically, but what happens when you have that self-doubt come to visit is you can't mentally access those positive feelings and the positive feedback because the spiral of negativity takes over and it's really hard to think positively when you're in a spiral of negativity. When I did the Masters in Positive Psychology, there's a, there's a research paper that's entitled Bad is Stronger Than Good. We remember the negatives more than we do the positives. We remember our failures more than we do our successes. So you need to note your positive feedback down somewhere, even if that is sending a quick note to yourself in an email saying blah, 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 such and such was said, and then store it in an email folder that says feedback. Or as somebody on a previous workshop said to me, they have an email folder and they've termed it wonderful me. It's up to you if you want to term yours wonderful me. Um, mine just says feedback. <laughs> but you can create one that has something that you store and collect it. So take pictures of things and store those somewhere. So you've actually got a record of that positive feedback. And don't yes, but it. Oh, yes, but it's because I worked hard. Yes, but it was because of this. Yes, and it by saying yes, and I learnt this whilst doing it. Yes, and I used this skill. Yes, and I used my knowledge in this particular area. So when you're going to note your positive feedback, yes, and it rather than yes, but it. So what happens with our successes? What happens when we do something well? We're using strengths. We're doing things that we're good at. So there's levels of all sorts of things. It's not just the academic side that you are good at, but we also tend not to necessarily focus on them. So could I ask you right now to go back into your groups, the people that you've been talking to so far, and share something that you are good at with them. So have a quick conversation. Okay. What was that like? Was that okay? Was that comfortable or was that a little bit embarrassing? Because we often don't like to talk about what we're good at. So I can't just say I'm good at this, I really want to counteract with it something that I'm not good at or, or with a, an excuse, yeah, but I'm, but I'm not bragging really, no, I, I, I get that's very often the way. We don't tend to be able to say I am good at and own it, that's something that I think you need to be more comfortable with, I am good at, own it without the excuses, just say yes. And also, I mean, there's lots of things that anybody, you know, is, is good at, but we think, is it good enough to share? We tend to also judge that. You know, good at walking, good at talking, good at listening. Oh, those aren't good enough. Those sorts of things. We tend to judge ourselves at something about, yes, should we share it? Or, or um, is it something that's worth speaking about? You think you sound arrogant. You don't. You sound as if you're owning it. There's a difference between being self-assured and arrogant. 
yeah and it's being self-assured so it's relabeling sometimes it's just relabeling the statements relabeling the way in which you're thinking about yourself you're absolutely not arrogant if you say i am good at this that is a really good point and what you're doing then is you are comparing yourself to the wrong person not that you'll find somebody who's worse at you than but you will always you will always find someone who is better than you smarter than you cleverer than you prettier handsomer you know thinner whatever it might have you will always find someone who is better than you at whatever it happens to be and when i say you're comparing yourself to the wrong person it's not about comparing yourself to others it's about comparing yourself to yourself so are you more knowledgeable than you were in september when you started this year at uni yes yes you do know more stuff now than you did, I hope. <laughs> but you do, if you think about it. So you're comparing yourself to yourself. Have you stretched the comfort zones? Have you gone out? Have you made friends? Have you met up with people? Do you feel more comfortable doing something that you didn't feel comfortable doing when you first started at uni? I bet the, the chances are saying yes. So you're comparing yourself to yourself. You are your benchmark in your learning, not your benchmark to other people. So don't compare yourself to others, compare yourself to yourself. You will always be learning, always be continuing on that journey. Your competition is the other person, but you have to be able to sell yourself. So you're just needing to understand your own strengths and abilities and be able to put those out there and articulate them. You are still not saying, I am better than that person because that would be arrogant, that, that level of saying, I'm better than they are that you have your own knowledge, skills and abilities to be able to do the job. That's the, that's the simple question that somebody's looking for is, can they do that job? So it's how you compare yourself and thinking about, yes, I've learned this, yes, I'm able to do that. So how do you stop mentally comparing yourself? Stop mentally comparing yourself. You know, it, it's, it, there is a level of you get what you focus on and deciding to make a decision in your mind that your thoughts will be ones that, yes, you get the random thoughts. Yes, you'll get the, oh my goodness, I'm up against so-and-so and how are they going to react and they're better than me. Then you retrack and say, which thoughts do I want to focus on? If you focus on the thoughts of, I can do this, I have developed that, then it will help you be more self-assured. If I could encourage you to turn your piece of paper landscape rather than portrait, because walls typically are that way on, it doesn't really matter, and draw a number of bricks. They need to be big enough to write in. It doesn't really matter quite how many bricks, but they need to be big enough to write in. So if you've got big writing, big bricks. If you've got small writing, small bricks will be fine. Now, individually, I'd like you to fill out let's say somewhere between three and five bricks that are specific moments in time that you can reflect back on that you feel good about. You don't need to remember the exact date, but I'll give you an example. These are things that you feel good about that sometimes nobody else noticed. So for me, when I was at school, we used to do cross country running, which I was good at the stamina, but I was lousy at jumping the hurdles. And I used to end up with really bruised shins when we had to do cross-country running. One day, I remember jumping the hurdle and leaving it standing behind me. Yes. One of those real feel-good moments. But everybody else saw what should happen. For me, it was something that was important. So it doesn't have to be big in anyone else's eyes. It doesn't have to be massive in your own eyes. It's just one of those, yes, I'm pleased with that. So it could be something that from your school days, it could be whether it's how you felt passing your driving test. But for me, I can't remember the, the instructor telling me about passing my driving test, but I do remember the first drive I took in the car alone and felt good about that. So it's something that you can reflect on. It could be a family birthday. It could be, of course, opening up the Oxford admissions envelope email these days <laughs> but it's those you know it doesn't matter but something for you that you feel good about and see if you can find three to five and write one per brick on your wall so for some people this exercise is really easy and for others it can be quite challenging it can be one of those where I'm wondering have I got anything I can write down 
oh, that's not good enough to go on the wall. No, I couldn't possibly put that. So it depends on whether or not you're used to thinking and picking up on the positives. So sometimes if you're, if you're not used to that, it can be really difficult to think, what have I done that's good? Because if I asked you to write down all of the failures that you'd had, you might well be able to write far more, far quickly. But it's interesting when I ask you to write out the positives because reflecting back on those is going to be something that I'll encourage you to do. So if you could do it now, just have a quick moment and reread the ones that you have written down about. So just spend a moment and reflect on who were you with, what was happening, how did you feel at that point in time? So just reread any of the things or all of the things that you've written down on your wall so far. How do you feel as you are looking at those and rereading them? Positive. Really positive, yeah? Anybody else feel positive? Yeah? What other feelings do you have? What other labels do you want to give that positive feeling? Smug. Smug. It's like, yes, cool. Me? Sometimes surprised. Some people look, it's like, oh, proud. Yeah? Good. Powerful. Powerful. Lovely. So, all of these things, though, if you can reflect and look at things that you have done, the achievements that you have done so far and feel good about. So coming back to some of the questions that you had at the start. How not to feel the imposter when you're doing something new. Well, it's normal self-doubt, so you can label it as that, but you could also look at the objective evidence. So you could look at either your collection of feedback or something like your confidence wall that says, look, I've done these things so far. I don't know if I can do this one. I've overcome other challenges. I've done other things. Let's see what happens. So you could use it for that. Thinking about encouraging yourself to go for things, very much so from the confidence wall perspective is one of those ways you can give yourself, well, if I've done these things and I can feel proud, I can feel powerful, then yes, I can go for this particular opportunity and give yourself that encouragement by reflecting back. So I give you the encouragement to use your confidence wall, not as it stands right now, but add to it or create one in a picture format that you can store somewhere. So collect a number of things that help you feel good, but they need to reflect back to things that you have done. So not pictures of things that you would like to do or pictures of places you would like to visit. That might be good, but pictures of things that you can say, yes, I've done that. Yes, I learned that. Yes, I've achieved that. So they're going back into the past and bringing those into the now. That way you'll be able to give your confidence a boost when you need it. So reflecting on your strengths, if you don't know what your strengths are, how can you possibly sell yourself in interviews? So you're absolutely right, that star stories is a really good way of collecting things. But also, if you don't know what your strengths are, you can take online profiles. I've created a web page, which I'll show you the website at the very end, but for those of you who can't stay to the, the very end, no one, one has, to, has to leave, it's kateatkin.com slash Oxford. I thought I'd make it nice and easy. And on there, there are some links to some strength profiles, one of which is free, Values in Action. And you can go and take a strength profile if you want to. Or you could simply ask your friends and have a conversation and share, what is it I'm good at? Because as you found out here in the front, it's very easy to pick out things that other people are good at and not necessarily easy for you to pick them out for yourself. So knowing and using your strengths is a way of giving your confidence a boost, overcoming the imposter phenomenon, and also reflecting back on things that you have done using the confidence wall. There is a problem sometimes in our thinking if we have the imposter that comes to visit, and the problem is this P word. Anybody want to hazard a guess at what P might stand for? Perfect. Yes, mm -hmm. must be perfect. Who here is perfect? Who here is human? Yeah. And coming with humans means we will all make mistakes. We are perfectly imperfect, as it were. So that side of things, we can't expect to be perfect. We can't expect to get it right. We can't expect to get, if you have got 100% in something, you can't expect to get 100% all of the time. 
but we think unrealistically that we should. And that problem with perfection could be paralyzing for someone who has the imposter because we then fear failure because that proves we're not perfect, that then proves that we are no good at, and we catastrophize it all rather than saying, oh, well, that was one thing I can learn from, which I'll come to failure in a moment. But be aware of that perfection word. And this is what happened to me in my second academic essay, because I know I said I put a lot of work into my first one. I put even more into my second one. My husband happened to make a passing comment of, oh, you've got a distinction. You could go for a distinction overall, Kate. Ah, oh, nothing like putting the pressure on then, is there? So I worked my socks off even more for the second one. Didn't get a distinction. Because I'd actually put in extra, extra, extra effort and it had decreased the performance rather than got to that optimal level. So there's a lovely book and a lovely phrase by a chap called Tal Ben-Shahar. He talks about the pursuit of perfect. That's the title of one of his books. And his phrasing is go for optimal, not perfection. So yes, there's hard work involved. And if you have this desire for perfection and you are one that goes for that 110, 120, 150%, then may I suggest you scale it back a tad and scale it back where for you, it's about 80%. For others, it would be their 100%, which is absolutely fine. But just think about if you could scale it back a little and not put extra, extra, extra effort in. Yes, you want to get a good degree. Yes, you want to get good marks. But sometimes you have to let it go because there's more than one essay to be written. Sometimes you have to say, oh, okay, I could make it better, I think, but this is as good as I can get it right now. And press the send button and say, that's as good as I can do at this point in time. That will be good enough. Because sometimes if you put that extra effort in, you end up decreasing your performance and not increasing it. And you create heightened stress and anxiety along the way. So don't aim for perfection, aim for optimal. Then of course there is the F word, that failure piece that we have to be aware of. And we have to be aware of failure in that we don't tend to like it. I, if I'm honest, really honest, I do not like failing. But I also know that I should do it more often because it's a good way to learn. The Oxford English Dictionary describes failure or defines failure as this lack of success or the neglect or omission of a desired outcome. I found when I was doing my research with the entrepreneurs that they had a completely different way of viewing failure, which I thought was so much more liberating. And it was really simple, things that didn't work. When things don't work, what do you do? Learn from it, try something else. You don't label it as it is a failure or I am a failure. It's that didn't work, learn from it, move on. That essay wasn't as good as it needed to be, learn from it, think about how I can improve for the next one. That interview didn't go as well as I would have liked it for my internship or my job. What can I learn from it? Think about it, move on to the next one. Because you will experience failures. And how to do it? Well, we can respond to failure in two ways. You can either think about flipping the failure or you can think about fudging the failure and not acknowledging it. And if you fudge it, then I reckon all's lost. You're not actually learning anything from it. But if you flip the failure and don't label it as a failure, but label it as something that didn't work, it was an outcome I didn't want, what can I learn? So learning from failure, which comes back to this point about how to make failures productive. Just don't label them as failures. Learnings, not failures. It'd be very different sort of terminology. So the self-doubt experience that I've mentioned before is normal. It's that aspect of it's okay to wonder whether or not you will succeed. And then when you have succeeded, it's okay to say yes. I have succeeded, I have done that, and I learned this along the way. 
It's that idea of acknowledging that self-doubt is perfectly normal. The self-doubt when you are experiencing it from a, I've done this so many times before, I really shouldn't be worried now. That's the imposter feelings. And you've then got to say, I've done it so many times, I shouldn't be worried now. I need to let it go and label it as the imposter and try and put that one into a box. So could I encourage you to have another conversation with each other and talk about a failure, if you would. So talk about something that you failed at and learnt from. So have a quick conversations with each other about your failures and your learnings. So what was it like talking about your failures? It's a bit nerve wracking. Or because you've now been speaking about various things that it seem okay. What was it like listening to someone else's failure? Makes you feel better. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, yeah, they're human too. It's like, oh yeah. Great. And did anybody hear somebody share a failure and you're going, well, what's the big deal? It's not that bad. Yeah. And I think we should talk more about the failures. We tend to, just coming back to this social media age that was going through my mind, is this aspect, we tend to think that everything we must put out there is really positive. We must share everything that we're doing and we must always put the really great photo, not the gurning one up there, yeah? <laughs> but that's, that's a knowing giggle by somebody who takes quite a number of photos to get the right ones. But, but it's that aspect, sometimes if we, you know, I do too, and when I'm, just, when I'm speaking and somebody takes a photo of me, oh, that's got a funny, on my, on my face. <laughs> but it's one of those things that we should talk about our failures more often to people. Encourage those conversations, but not as failures. Talk about our learnings more often. What have we learnt from not getting something right, from something that didn't work? And I think that then becomes a conversation that's wholly different than, oh my God, I'm feeling awful because I failed at X. Yeah? So think about how you can share more of those. There's another quote that I'd like to share with you by a lady called Brené Brown, is you can choose courage or you can choose comfort, but you cannot choose both. Applying to Oxford has meant that you are absolutely not choosing that route for comfort. You are choosing courage being here now and saying, right, I'm going to do something, go beyond whatever it might be that's expected. And this is where, how do you feel representative when in a minority? I don't know. In that you, you might not feel representative, but you feel okay and deserving of being here because you're choosing the courageous route rather than that comfortable route. And I would encourage you to do so. So thinking about what you're going to do next, what was going through, my, there's, there's one point that I'd like to share with you before I ask you to then talk to each other for one final time here before I close. Um, and when I was doing some research again on the imposter, I've just, I finished in September the literature review. I say finished. I've got as far as I can at the moment. Obviously, it'll be an ongoing thing. And a piece of research that I came across is linking the imposter phenomenon to narcissism. Now, narcissism is this thinking about, it's all about me. It's this more than arrogance, it's worse than arrogance. It's the why, what am I putting out? What are people thinking of me? Oh my goodness, it's not going to be right. And I don't like to be thinking of myself as, oh my goodness, am I, am I a narcissist? When I'm thinking about my own thinking about the imposter phenomenon. And I realized that what I have been doing in the past is actually saying that what I believe about myself is far truer than what the external feedback has been. I'd been putting my own opinions above other people's. Now that to me is quite arrogant if I'm thinking about how I've been doing it. So I'm going to suggest that you take other people's opinions and understand why they think that and decide whether or not you're going to let that one in and make it a decision. And if it's positive, may I suggest you do let it in if you understand why and stop saying, 
ah, but, ah, but, that can't be me. Because then you are putting yourself over and above other people, which possibly could be narcissistic. So thinking about the final piece on arrogance that I'd like to touch on is when we talk about courage, yes, you need to have courage to succeed in life, to speak up now and beyond, whether it's speaking up in tutorials, whether it's presenting yourself at an interview, whether it's applying for internships, all of those take an element of courage and you will continue to need to have courage as you go through your careers and your life. Could I suggest you balance it with something that also means you will not be arrogant? So be courageous, and have consideration for other people. If you have those two in balance, you won't tip the scales into arrogance. So one final conversation in your small groups, what is it you're going to take away from this particular session?